Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Felicia Antonio, and I'm a campaigner and Keep It On lead at Access Now. For those of you who might not know the Keep It On campaign, it is a global campaign that unites over 220 organizations worldwide working to push back against internet shutdowns. It is such a privilege to have all of you join us for this important discussion on internet shutdowns and elections in 2020. The theme for this session is the fight to keep it on during elections, the role of stakeholders. And it's bringing together regional and international experts from the United Nations and civil society to delve into the incidents of internet shutdowns documented in 2020 during elections and explore how stakeholders can work together to raise awareness about these acts of repression and hold governments accountable. We look forward to having a compelling conversation with our distinguished panelists. Before we dive into the topic, I just want to mention that this press briefing is brought to you by Access Now and the Keep It On Coalition. I would like to give a brief overview of the event. The press briefing will last 75 minutes. The first part will be a discussion among our esteemed panelists, then followed by Q&As. I would like to urge participants to write their questions and comments in the open chat button on YouTube. Kindly indicate which speaker your questions are directed to, if possible. This event is being recorded and streamed live on the Access Now YouTube channel. Without further ado, I would like to invite our speakers to introduce themselves. Kindly tell us your name, your organization, and how internet shutdowns or blockings affected elections and its impact on democracy in your respective countries. Were there any justifications given by authorities for the shutdowns that were ordered? I will begin with Maria. Hello, thank you so much for having me. My name is Maria Sarungi Tahai. I'm from Tanzania. And um, I have been somebody who has been very active online through um, the hashtag Change Tanzania uh, since 2012. Change Tanzania was also registered as an organization later on in Tanzania, but it has currently been deregistered by the Magufuli regime. Um, briefly, when it comes to internet shutdown in Tanzania, we had an election on the 28th of October uh, this year. And before the election, there were already signs of disruptions uh, to the internet access. This comes on the heels of many repressive um, news, news media and uh, cyber users that has happened. Two important legislation that jumps out in terms of repression is the cybercrime law that was passed in 2015 and also a lot of regulations that followed. Then there is also the online content regulation that was passed by the government and it was updated just uh, months before the election. These regulations aim at curtailing the freedom of expression online. However, as we all know, it's very difficult to stop people from expressing their opinion online. You cannot try to lock up millions of users uh, who are interacting on internet, especially in Tanzania. What followed was uh, just before election, we saw uh, two, two type of uh, so-called restrictions to the internet. The first one uh, started in the form of what we saw was mainly on Twitter, but a little bit on Instagram. It was the reporting of accounts that were very vocal on these platforms that were very critical of the government some were even whistleblowing sites. And what happened is they were being reported for so-called copyright, um, copyright um, violations, what they call the D D DMCA uh, reports on Twitter. They also did similar actions on, on, on Instagram. So how, this, how would this work? The way it would work is that they would um, take your account, take any tweet, it could be even a past tweet. They would report it if it contains a photo, but sometimes just content in its own. And they would claim that they owe the copyright and they've suffered loss because of you 
tweeting out that content. Of course, this was not true, but once they would do that, uh, Twitter's policy is such that once there is a copyright violation, your account first would be simply, um, you'd be blocked from, from, from posting anything unless you accept that you have, create, you have actually violated the rules. And then after three, four times, your account would be completely suspended. At the same time, when you report this, what would follow was that you would have to actually give in your name, your address, your telephone number, uh, and it would be shown to the party that has reported you. This was very, uh, very, very important aspect, especially for those who are whistleblowers, because then they would need to divulge their true identity. These were the, the so-called methods that were used at the beginning to try to curtail the freedom of expression. And these, this was often done by, by uh, parties that we believe are affiliated to the government and to the state security. What followed after that was uh, we saw in, on the eve of election, a few days before election, um, there was also um, the SMS, bulk SMS, in theory, that's what they were trying to stop. Uh, the, the regulator, TCRA, gave a letter to all the um, service providers, telecom service providers, telling them that they have to make sure that there is no bulk SMS sent out. It is very strange that this letter came out, uh, but the claim was it came after one of the uh, sports betting companies sent out a mass SMS uh, particularly asking um, people to vote for the sitting president, Magufuli. Um, and this was supposedly the reaction, but what happened is that keywords were filtered via SMS. I don't think we've ever seen that. Um, maybe some of my colleagues on this call have seen it in their countries. But what we saw was if you try to send an SMS with the name of an opposition politician or a political party, Later, uh, we found that even, even Magufuli, the sitting president himself, if you try to send an SMS, your SMS would not deliver. So this was the kind of censorship that we saw. And after a big outcry, um, some of the telecom companies um, then you know, stepped back and allowed the SMS to go through, but there are a few who kept the, the, the block on. We also saw uh, during election and 24 hours before election, the jamming of the IP addresses. I'm sure my colleagues can talk more about that. What happened is you couldn't log on to Twitter, you couldn't log on to Facebook, you couldn't log on to even WhatsApp. The usage of WhatsApp was a problem unless you used the VPN. Many of the, the, the Tanzanian um, internet users were not prepared. Um, although we had discussed this before through ch our Change Tanzania account and through other accounts as well, uh, some of us who have been very active on social media, we warned that this might happen, and it's exactly what happened. To date, Twitter is not accessible without a VPN in Tanzania. So I, I'm just trying to quickly wrap it up, um, and um, I think that will give you a picture of what happened. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Maria, for that detailed um, account. I think um, I would just move straight to Alexei and Yana to tell us what happened in um, Belarus during the elections with regards to shutdowns. Hello, uh, my name is Alexey Kazluk. I'm from Human Constanta team. Human Constanta is a Belarusian human rights uh, NGO, and we deal with several issues. And one of those issues uh, are uh, digital rights. Uh, and um, this year we started to look closely to uh, what is happening to internet in Belarus, what is happening to shutdowns and uh, internet blockings. And that was the right time for, for it because uh, in August we had presidential elections. And um, uh, so before the elections and uh, after that, we, uh, we saw uh, some internet disruptions. Uh, well, nationwide shutdown and uh, each Sunday we experience uh, local shutdown, shutdowns of mobile internet. So uh, I think that uh, Jana will continue. So she will introduce herself and then uh, we, we somehow uh, will deliver this, uh, the, the main issues uh, we saw in Belarus, which are quite similar to what is happening in other unfree countries. Yeah, thank you. Uh... My name is Jana Gancherova. I'm from Human Constanta Human Rights Organizations, too. Uh, same as um, Alexei. And as he already mentioned, yeah, this year we faced, uh, well, it was, I would say, first uh, 
such a big uh, shutdown. It wasn't like classical shutdown because um, it was some channel, but it was reduced like 80% and still we have a possibility to go to outside internet, but it was really uh, hard for for most of the people and only those who uh, who was prepared with VPNs, with different kind of VPNs, uh, with different kind of uh, tools, uh, they had a, had an opportunity to to connect with the world and to understand what's going on here in, in Minsk. And there were uh, there were a lot of uh, sad uh, events and. Um, uh, po police uh, police uh, brutality out the streets and uh, protests and for three days from 9 till 12 uh, uh, August of August uh, we faced this global massive shutdown for most of the people in Belarus uh, after three days uh, the internet was uh, uh, switched on again but now every Sunday uh, when the uh, peaceful demonstrations uh, uh, are on the streets. Uh, we face uh, the uh, mobile providers uh, had to switch off the mobile internet uh, because of the order of uh, of government, and uh, it's uh, it's really hard hard to bear with. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's what we have right now in Belarus. And yeah, and and we still okay. have uh, like uh, more than hundred uh, media websites of um, media websites human rights organizations websites blocked uh, vpn providers blocked and new blockings come in like every week yeah well and that was the first time we observed uh, using uh, usage of uh, dpi equipment in belarus so we knew that uh, it was uh, somehow installed but uh, we never saw uh, we never saw how how it is, how it is used, and so uh, they tried to, uh, to to switch it on and to test it before August, and then uh, August nine till till eleven, they uh, they switched it on, uh, but that was not successful. So I think that that shutdown was the result of uh, poor management of this um, um, like. Uh, of this censorship, massive censorship. So they wanted to control the flow of information, but not to stop it completely. Uh, but uh, effectively, they just switched off internet. Uh, so to add to this, so we had uh, we, we had seen this. Um, yeah. Let's let's move to the next speaker, and then um, we'll come back to you um, in the subsequent questions. Yeah, sure. All right. So uh, okay. So mom. Um, you, uh, in Myanmar, the internet shutdown in Rakhine and China began last year and it, it was still ongoing during the elections. Could you tell us um, some of the human rights violations that occurred and um, briefly about that? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Mao Songker from Myanmar. Uh, I'm an activist and also an executive director of ATEN. And I mean, and, and then is the activist organization working for free expression in Myanmar. And then com combined the, the lawsuit fine under the telecommunication law, the BFU assembly and BFU procession law, section 505 of Penal Code. Um, and also combined the number of journalist charges, uh, monitor, document, and report the violation of free speech and prostitution over free expression in Myanmar. So, According to our report, uh, there are three main things that violated final expression. The first one is there is no effective abolishment or amendment or law that are used to violate final expression. So then, and the second one is the continuing arrest through using those kind of law. So there are at least 539 lawsuits in with several laws and revision that are represent to Vienna expression, which is again no less than 1051 individuals. So the test and final violation is internet shutdown and block website. People's right to access, right to seize, access and, and access to information and media freedom are violated, particularly in internet shutdown in eight townships from Rakhine and one township from 
Chin State. Survey showed that uh, every single civilian and who live uh, who live in the those state or, or have their economies, uh, social, medical, political, and educational right violated because the, the government cut off the uh, internet in that conflict tone state uh, with an issue of national security. But the government ordered the telecommunication operator to block more than 200 websites. Uh, the block website included uh, some official news media, uh, although the government and telecommunication operator did not publish a So, uh, In August of this year, internet shutdown went sportively live. But instead of uh, Instead of a like uh, a fast speed 4G connection, only a limitation, uh, only a, a limited 2G internet connection was restored. So internet uh, internet shutdown was uh, imposed last year, uh, and his uh, uh, has continued uh, throughout that time, even when the COVID-19 pandemic started to hit the country and raise in many areas of Myanmar. Uh, and also, there's a, a, a best New is like uh, Myanmar Union and uh, Election Commission can say the election in the conflict ridden region of their country, especially in international town area. So well, actually, uh, 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 we all know our, our government had to uh, have the duty to the protect at the right to freedom you know, expression and information, especially when the government and is said is demo uh, like democrat uh, de democratically elected. So uh, the, the situation in Myanmar is like uh, wolves and wolves, and but you know, um, internet shutdown is, is stay stay here, uh, and and when we are uh, as as a as an organization, a uh, free speech activist organization, we are uh, asking to the government, and we are doing protest campaign and, and, and mobilization and to people uh, to get the awareness how how. Everything is getting involved in that in the conflict area and in the national down area. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much, Mo. Um, I would skip um, Peggy for now, but Natalia, can you introduce yourself and just briefly your um, highlights on the topic? I'll come back to you later in the discussion, but um, so that we can move into the discussion topic. Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Natalia Krapiva, and I'm a tech legal counsel at Access Now. We are an international organization with a mission to defend and extend uh, digital rights of users at risk. And we're also the founders of the Keep It On Coalition. Uh, and I work on the Digital Security Helpline, which is a 24-7 um, digital uh, security assistance for civil society at risk. And we provide assistance, which includes uh, circumvention of uh, shutdowns and censorship. Um, and I also work on a legal arm, which uh, we lead our litigation work uh, and we um, challenge internet shutdowns through legal means. Uh, and in terms of, just to sort of sum up, uh, in terms of the shutdown cases that we see, uh, and the justifications that we see that the governments provide, it's usually something very vague and broad, such as national security or prevention of hate speech. But in fact, what we see is that uh, in reality, all they want to do is suppress peaceful protests and eliminate uh, dissenting opinions and hide human rights violations that are committed by state actors. So the reality on the ground is very different from the stated reasons that the governments uh, provide. And so this of course undermines the very foundation of democracy. So this is just something that we see and we can talk about it more as we go along. Yeah. All right, thank you, um, Natalia. Uh, um, I would move to, uh, I would like to um, acknowledge the presence of Peggy Hicks, who is the Director for Thematic Engagement Special Procedures and Rights to Development Division at the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights. Thank you so much, Peggy, for making time to join us. And so um, I would want to dive the conversation to your office now. Um, the issue of internet shutdowns and its impacts on human rights remains a top priority for the United Nations Human Rights Council. 
over the years, the UN has been very instrumental um, in this regard. And we've seen um, resolutions being passed um, in 2016 and was further um, maintained in 2018, uh, which condemned internet shutdowns and urging states to refrain from using such measures. As the director for engagement, thematic engagement, special procedures, and right to development division at the office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, we would like to find out how internet shutdowns impact human rights and also some of the work being done by your office when it comes to um, combating internet shutdowns and um, their impact on human rights um, around the globe. Great, thank you so much for uh, allowing me to join you all today. Um, thanks, of course, to Access Now for your incredible work in this space, but also to the courageous efforts that we've just heard described by all of our colleagues on the call. Shutdowns, as we see uh, during elections, have become, unfortunately, a common practice in many regions. And what we see is that they generally fail to meet the requirements imposed by human rights law, which are that they have to be both necessary and proportional uh, to, the, to the need in, in case. And when we see these things happen, they really do have an enormous impact on the ability of entire communities to communicate and to access and share information. The, the rights that are affected is really a broad range because people have a right to participate in public affairs. They obviously have a right to vote and even to stand for election. And all of those required, uh, rights require access to information. And of course, that's particularly important in the context of elections where we need open safe space for public debates and protests and other activities. So it's particularly severe when we have a shutdown around elections because uh, this important space is, is, is undermined. And we see that happening both uh, before, during, and after uh, an election. So before, um, everyone obviously needs information about the candidates and the process. Um, there's a need to correct uh, election disinformation. There's a need to disseminate updated information on voting. So all sorts of information needs before elections. During an election, um, information sharing uh, is often restricted and a full shutdown can obscure um, election related problems. It can assist with voter suppression um, and election monitoring, uh, under, undermine election monitoring, and it can um, impede information needed by election observers. After elections, shutdowns can have very dangerous consequences as well because um, after elections, it's often a period where tensions are high, where there may be protests um, after an election has ended. And so the shutdown has an impact at that stage as well. In a sensitive high, uh, high stakes electoral environment, these disruptions can also just affect the integrity and transparency of the electoral uh, process. And that leads to widespread suspicion that the process is being interfered with or manipulated and possibly even to rejection of the official election results or to violence. The shutdown can also be seen as in favor of or directed at a particular group or party, and again, creating the perception that the measure is intended for electoral gain. So because of all those impacts, there's been a lot of work, as you mentioned, um, in the human rights space on this. Um, I have just a couple of points. I know I've already gone on long, but one is that the Human Rights Committee, which is the treaty body that interprets mon and monitors state performance under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, adopted a very important general comment on peaceful assemblies recently that expressly indicates that states must not resort to shutdowns in the context of protests. Um, so that's an important touch point. Um, and it's very specific in that it applies um, you know, to any action taken to block, hinder internet connectivity in relation to peaceful assembly. So I'd urge everybody to take a look at that. Our office also monitors and reports on human rights issues during electoral periods, including restrictions on freedom of expression, assembly, and internet shutdowns. So just as an example, our high commissioner has expressed concerns on shutdowns um, that occurred in all the countries that have been addressed in this briefing. So in Belarus, as protests escalated following the elections, we noted uh, that many social media and news websites were completely blocked. Last month, when commenting on the pre-electoral context in Myanmar, the High Commissioner noted a concerns uh, with concern the fact that internet shutdown effectively remained in place in Rakhine and Chin states. And just two weeks ago, 
The High Commissioner expressed concern at the blocking of messaging and social media platforms happening in Tanzania. So uh, that's a summary of, of some of the ways that we've engaged in this important space and looking forward to hearing more from all of you. Thank you so much. And indeed the human rights violations that you've noted do resonate with um, the Keep It On Coalition as well, because um, um, we do document such violations whenever the internet is disrupted across the globe. And so um, I would throw the question to all panelists um, to let us know some of the details of how some of the human rights violations that were documented in their respective countries. So maybe let me start with um, Alexei and Yana and Maria, any of you can feel free to start. And I would come to um, Mong after that. Yeah, well, I think maybe Alex and Yana can go and then I'll come in just to just to spice up. <laughs> they can go ahead. <laughs> okay. All right. So um Alexei, would you start? Yeah, you have two minutes to do that. Yeah. Well, okay. So what kind of uh, human rights violation basically faced uh, not only well, all these internet shutdown was uh, uh, was there to violate uh, human rights in Belarus because the main idea of the sh shutdown was to uh, avoid the spread of uh, information from the streets in Belarus where uh, where brutal uh, brutal arrests uh, happened uh, through all the, these three days and uh, basically the idea was uh, was that no one will um, know know the, the scale of these events because it was really huge and massive and everywhere. And uh, I think the second idea was, um, well, our government believes that someone uh, coordinating these protest protests uh, via Telegram, uh, via um, other kinds of internet, uh, internet co connections. And uh, I think that uh, it was hoped that if they will uh, just switch it off, so everything would be fine, but still uh, it, it, it goes and we see that, uh, not uh, not all their actions uh, our government are ready to uh, admit uh, because still they didn't admit that it was uh, the DPI uh, which was used to switch off the internet to make shutdown in Belarus and for these days in August um, they said that it was uh, DDoS attacks on different infrastructure infrastructure of uh, Belarusian providers. Uh, and this is their position basically. And uh, now uh, all these um, switches, uh, when they reduces the speed of uh, mobile uh, internet work, uh, uh, they say that it due to um, safety, national safety. That's uh, that's basically all that happened, and there is no transparency in these uh, in these actions, uh, and uh, they didn't sh show any orders or any uh, documents uh, on where on the, on which bi uh, biased all these um, all these events, uh, all these uh, switch switching offs uh, of internet, and uh, more than that, we we see that. Uh, mobile providers uh, here in Belarus are not ready for transparency too. Uh, we have three three like main uh, mobile providers, and one of them is A1, which is Austrian uh, mobile operator. Austrian they have had a headquarter in Aust Austria, and even them, mm, uh, even they are not ready to be more open for society, even though they face all the um, oh, this push, you know, from society on them. And uh, basically, we still don't have the answer uh, who exactly uh, do that, shutdowns, and who exactly is responsible for them. Uh, though we have some ideas about that, and we understand how it happened, basically, technically. Uh, well, Alexei, maybe you can add something? Um let, yes, me remind, that, uh... Uh, let me just remind our um, participants that um, you can drop your questions or comments in the YouTube chat button um, for us to address them. 
if you have any. And let's say I will give you 30 seconds to add on and then I will move to Maria. Yeah, sure. I think that Jana uh, made a, a good picture of what, what is actually happening in Belarus. So it is a number of different instruments used by government and they don't use it uh, publicly. So they deny um, switching, switching off internet. Like this shutdown is not their business and that's it. Uh, so this is combined to uh, like, um, so the legal default uh, we experience uh, today. So it is hard to use, uh, usual, I would say usual human rights uh, instruments to combat, it, uh, combat this. Uh, so that's why we rely more on technical, uh, technical experience and technical instruments to circumvent those restrictions. So th this is our priority now. Okay, great. Um, would I think there's a section that would discuss more about the role the uh, ISPs played in the disruptions in Belarus. So Maria, kindly highlight some of the human rights violations that sure. were documented during the shutdown. Yeah, thank you very much, Felicia. Um, first of all, it's very important to understand that in Tanzania, um, the social media became and it still is um, one of the most important sources of independent um, news. Uh, this means that um, most of the media houses have faced restrictions. Um, one of the media houses that I actually led, uh, Kwanzaa Online TV has been suspended for 11 months. So any formal media, it can be curtailed very easily through legislation. So what has happened is we've seen uh, during election and more and more, I think after the election, it continues is citizen journalists. C citizen journalists would, would take to social media and post what is happening. They would have uh, footages about uh, different activities. Now, one of the things that during election they tried to curtail was uh, footages of rigging. Uh, there were people who were caught with, with, with pre-marked fake ballots. Uh, there was an issue of police, police and security brutality, including footage from Zanzibar of people dressed in, in, in security uniforms beating citizens. Um, and then you had November 2nd, after the election, the opposition trying to organize for protest. Um, so there, were, there was a lot of activity going on that were curtailed by the shutdown. And this is very important because one important aspect has also been the vote tallying. As you know, vote tallying in any election is very important in order to allow independent tallying for the, for the opposition. What happened in Tanzania is in, in particularly in Zanzibar is that the tallying center that was set up by the opposition was raided by the security forces. And uh, one of the senior politicians who was leading the tallying center, Mazrui Nasoro, was then abducted by the forces kept incommunicado for more than 10 days. Uh, apparently, according to his party, he was also severely tortured and he was only let go after the opposition filed a so-called habeas corpus uh, case in, in court, forcing the security forces to, to, to take him out. So there's a lot of human rights violation that is directly linked also to the accessibility of internet. Just to quickly put in a very important point, um, mobile providers uh, informally try to give us feedback and claim that they may not necessarily be able to stop some of these restrictions. And one of the information that we got from mobile service providers was the IXP. Uh, so these are the gateways that have been used uh, for internet in Tanzania. There is no independent IXP. So everything is managed by the government. So if they decide to shut off a, a certain website, then they can do it even without the cooperation of the mobile phone uh, operators. Although I must add, I don't think that completely exonerates them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, all right, so Mon, you have been, um, you have experienced human rights violations for um, exercising your rights. And so can you tell us what happened and why were you um, prosecuted for protesting against the shutdown that happened in, well, that is ongoing in Myanmar? Yes, um, uh, actually, uh, uh, the, the, pro uh, the protests have largely focused on the uh, internet restriction in Rakhine and Chin State. Uh, authority arrest a separate individual for the protest against international shutdown. According to uh, our organization, then 
61 activists have, have been prostituted for campaigning against the international down in Rakhine and Chin State. So I'm, I'm one of them uh, who, who were convicted under the uh, Bifu Assembly and Bifu Processing Law. So I'm, I'm just put a, a, a banner on, on it, on it over past, uh, in Yango, uh, which read, uh, is, is the internet, internet being shut down to hide war crime and killing people? So it doesn't matter for me because uh, the sentence is just 50 days in prison or, or, or fine, you know. But you know, there are two students and who have been convicted for over seven years in prison now for their protest with several lawsuits at different, uh, you know, at, at the different township call. Uh, these are uh, the, the these are the, the reason why I would like to say like uh, the authority or, or intentionally attempt to 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 get criticize uh, 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 critics of their own current shutdown. So, uh, moreover, like authority did not uh, publicize that justification for internet shutdown. Uh, according to the 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 one only one operator, uh, Telino uh, making a statement, uh, the government direct, uh, directed uh, reference and uh, it's like uh, you know disturbance of the P and use of the internet service to coordinate illegal activity, uh, like you know uh, as a justification for the internet shutdown. Uh, uh, the government uh, has uh, yes to make an official statement, uh, and it's remain. And clear how long the internet was international down way continue uh, in our country. All right, thank you. Um, more once again, I would like to turn around the um, the outline a bit. So before I get back to Peggy to give us some highlights on how we can work with um, the OHCHR. I would like to call Natalia to speak more about how um, Sandvine, which is a US owned company with Canadian connections was involved in the Belarus shutdown and what was some of the work that was done by Access Now and the Keep It On Coalition um, after Sandvine's rule was exposed and um, what impacts did they have? So Natalia, please take the floor. And then also in that presentation, you can also highlight some of the work um, being done with um, the ISPs, particularly A1 Belarus, um, with regards to the shutdowns that happened in Belarus. Sure, thank you. So we know uh, the end of August, uh, Bloomberg, which like highlights again the role of journalists, uh, Bloomberg uh, came out with this publication revealing a uh, role of a US company with Canadian connections, uh, Senvine, um, their role in the Belarusian shutdowns. And it uh, revealed that their deep packet inspection technology was used to implement the shutdowns. And uh, in response to this, uh, Access Now and the Keep It On Coalition will la launch a campaign to bring attention to Sandvine's involvement in, in human rights violations in Belarus. Uh, so we published a, a blog post uh, calling out Sandvine as well as their owners, Francisco Partners, which are a US uh, investor company that also previously owned the NSO group, which is also notoriously a bad uh, uh, company that is famous for their human rights violations. So, um, so we, we sent, uh, we published this blog post and we called out also on um, US officials, uh, such as um, a, a California Attorney General, as well as State Department and the Congress to investigate Sandvine and Francisco partners and see how they were able to sell this equipment to the Belarusian uh, regime, which is, has been known to be a dictatorship for over 20 years. And quite famous for their human rights violations. And at the same time, there was also a surge of um, 
campaign uh, campaigns in different parts in Belarusian diaspora in US and Canada protested and sent letters also to the company. Uh, the US officials responded to our call and also uh, made some inquiries into the work of uh, into this contract between Sandvine and Belarusian uh, government. Um, and the state uh, Senator Dick Durbin called on an investigation of the, uh, the, the Treasury, US Department of Treasury, to investigate the deal. And then our partners, Keep It On partner Uni, uh, together with Human Constanta and uh, Digital Observers Community Belarus, uh, they also published a report uh, confirming that the DPI technology was used in internet shutdowns and, sen and censorship in um, Belarus. So uh, because of all this tremendous public pressure, uh, even though Sandvine initially said, no, actually it's not our fault, we don't have any responsibility for what happens, it's not a human rights violation, internet is not part of human rights, which is a outrageous statement uh, uh, because it is. Um, and uh, so under this public pressure, they finally gave up and they announced that they were ending their contract with the Belarusian government uh, because they discovered that their equipment was used in violation of human rights. And they accepted that internet was actually an important part of human rights. Um, however, Access Now and the Keep It On Coalition, we are continuing our calls uh, for accountability uh, because the harms that were already done, uh, they need to be remediated. And um, there also, um, there's also concerns about multiple reports still coming out about Sandvine's technology being used in other parts of the world for both censorship, uh, blocking of websites, shutdowns, and surveillance so um so like we have seen uh, i mean there were past reports by citizen lab uh the equipment used in turkey egypt and syria and then just recently bloomberg almanasa uh, Kuriam, um other um other organizations masar came out and just documented dozens and dozens of countries with a horrible human rights record and uh, actually Sandvine's own financial statements showed that they in fact were um, doing business in those countries and providing equipment. So this is very concerning and we think uh, it's a good thing that the Sandvine withdrew from Belarus. However, they need to still be held accountable for getting the past harm done and the harm that they're still causing in all these other countries. Um, so they should, we, th we do think that they should end uh, operations there. And just also to briefly mention A1. So A1 is another company and Yana and Alexei mentioned. So they are the ones, they are mobile operators and they are the ones responsible for throttling internet every Sunday in Belarus when the protesters come out. It became like a tradition already. And they announce it on Twitter every time. Hey, we're shutting down internet again. This is a state order. I apologize for inconvenience, something like this. Um, and uh, and we did also publish a letter, we sent them a letter urging them to denounce shutdowns and uh, commit to accountability. And I mean, we do give them some credit, at least they announced it on Twitter and like other companies. Uh, uh, and they also published a um, financial statement recently, which uh, showed that they actually hurt financially by the shutdowns, their customers are unhappy and they've suffered some losses. However, they still keep doing it. And uh, that's why we, we do think that we, you know, we still call on them to, uh, you know, to challenge the shutdowns, to commit to accountability, to preserve evidence, as well as to reveal uh, who is ordering, what is the actual process of the shutdowns. Um, and uh, we, we do encourage them also to challenge the shutdowns in courts. Uh, and uh, I mean, this is something that we do as Access Now and Keep It On Coalition. We we work, we try to work with telcos, and uh, convince them to do the right thing. However, we have seen examples where uh, telcos were also sued. Like for example, in Sudan, where two telco companies, MTN and Sudatel, were successfully sued, and uh, that lawsuit ended the shutdowns in the country. 
So I think there's definitely a range of actions that we can take while dealing with telcos uh, who are implementing these uh, illegal shutdowns. It's very heartwarming to hear that um, um, Sandvine did cancel its contract with um, the government, even though you rightly said um, the impacts of the shutdown on people's lives and the violations um, on human rights, we cannot um, pay back for that, but um, it's a good step and we'll continue to push back um, at Access Now and the Keep It On Coalition against internet shutdowns across the globe. So um, our esteemed panelists have highlighted some of the work that they've done and the challenges that you experience in pushing back against internet shutdowns. And so I would want to go back to Peggy to find out how we can hold governments accountable um, for shutting down the internet since we do have resolutions and um, resolutions being passed by the UN um, denouncing internet shutdowns. And then also to find out what's opportunities there are for stakeholders such as civil society organizations and state and non-state actors to engage with in the fight against internet shutdowns. How can we collaborate um, with the office of the OHCHR um, to push back against internet shutdowns? And then also Peggy, you can include your concluding remarks in that since um, you would have to leave us soon. Thank, thank you so much, Felicia. And, and, and we really, uh, there's so much to say in this area. I'll try to limit myself. Uh, a number of the points have already been uh, brought up in terms of the work that Natalia and others uh, are doing and the Keep It On Coalition has done. Um, I, I just want to outline sort of the six areas in which we can really press for governments to, to do better in this area, governments and companies. I mean, the first and perhaps the most important as, as all of the work that we've heard about today shows is, is the importance of monitoring and reporting on what's happening. And this is where campaigns like Keep It On are, are so incredibly important um, to be able to understand this phenomenon and to give it visibility. So it's it's, it's all the different levels. It's how the shutdowns on, unfold, you know, the technical side of it that we've heard some about today in terms of the Belarus shutdown, how they're enforced, like what is the basis under law, how are authorities claiming that they're, they're legal and, and what do the authorities do to enforce them? And then also, you know, as, as we just heard, what have companies done to either enforce or challenge requests? The more information we get and the more comprehensive and coherent that is, I think the more effective we are in responding to these phenomenon. Um, and, you know, I know you all are doing a ton of work. That's one of the areas where we really like to work alongside you as much as possible to, to sort of take some of the, the civil society and NGO based information and really make it uh, be part of the, the conversation from the intergovernmental level as well as much as possible. The second piece I want to emphasize is the extent to which collaborative networks like Keep It On are, are so important. Um, it's, it's really clear that it's very difficult to address all of this just at the local level. And, and we really do need the coordination and ability to work across um, efforts to be able to be successful. We can learn from each other at the same time. Um, it also allows us to be better prepare um, and to sort of predict what's coming rather than wait till after it's happened. And as we've heard that sometimes um, you know, you can do a lot then, but it's better, of course, to get in in front of these things. The third piece is the role that courts can play, um, and that was referenced as well. Um, it is good to know that some of the challenges that have happened in courts have been successful on these issues. There are some decisions confirming the illegality of shutdowns in places like Indonesia and Pakistan, and we are very grateful to see the ECOWAS uh, Court of Justice opinion uh, this year, a ruling that the September 2017 internet shutdown ordered by the Togolese government uh, was an illegal restriction of freedom of expression. I know, of course, you all were in, engaged in making that happen. So um, that type of action, I think, is a, an important step in this. 
The fourth point I would raise is that um, the international human rights mechanisms, um, that's both at the level that I work, the United Nations, but also at regionally, you know, getting them to engage and understand how shutdowns affect all of the different rights. So it's not just engaging with the special rapporteur on freedom of expression, the most obvious one, but obviously freedom of um, assembly and association, but then also the broader range of rights that are affected by these shutdowns. Um, and, and really seeing it as, as that cross-cutting issue, I think can be very helpful. Um, I wanted to emphasize, and, and uh, following on Natalia, so much has already been said, but on what we demand of companies though. I mean, I think the example that we just heard shows the extent to which companies are not living up to the obligations that they have under the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. It, within that framework, they should be doing a human rights impact assessment to determine what the impact of their sale of different technologies and use of those technologies by end users will result in. Um, and they have a responsibility to mitigate and remedy for human rights consequences. So there's a lot of space there where we can really use that framework of the UN guiding principles on business and human rights to make companies step up and handle these issues differently. On a min at a minimum, we, as has been said, we need companies to fully disclose information on shutdowns um, in a timely manner and provide regular updates as to the services that are affected or restored. They should be very clear about the steps they've taken to address it and give explanations after the fact as to what's happened. And of course, as has been said, they should be pushing back and including by taking legal action, um, even though we recognize that in some cases that you know won't be that easy for, for companies to do, but you know that that is part of the toolbox they have to um, bring in. But then finally, I really want to emphasize that we, we, of course, always think about this in the context of elections on the civil and political rights side. But I think it's really important that we, we need to emphasize that when the Internet is shut down, it doesn't just um, have the, the, the impact that perhaps the government might be looking for in terms of political speech. Um, or dissent, it also has a much broader impact on a, on a full range of economic and social rights. And it's in that area that we have a lot of partners who could be much more part of the struggle than they already are, I think. So if we look at when uh, the impact of shutdowns on the right to access to the right to health or access to education, um, access to employment, all of those things impact on the achievement of the sustainable development goals. And it means that development organizations and other allies should be part of the struggle to push back against these internet shutdowns. So broadening the coalition by bringing up those impacts in a more prominent way, I think is, is a useful approach as well. And I'll stop there. I'll stay on as long as I can because I'd be really interested to hear the questions as well. But thank you so much for including me. Thank you very much, um, Peggy, once again. Um, we are really grateful to have you join us and thank you for accepting to stay on a bit longer. Um, so I'm going to open up for questions. The questions will be shared in the chat button here and then I will read them out. So, so I, Question to Yana and Alexei. Could you speak more on the ongoing ground efforts to challenge the shutdowns, such as judicialization, and how the people are dealing with the weekly shutdowns? How are they organizing around it? Um, do you want me to take it again, or it's fine? Well, uh, if I uh, if I got the question, so this is about so which uh, activities are like from the side of civil society are um, taken. Okay, so uh, we just saw the first uh, the first case against A1 uh, because of those shutdowns. Uh, so it was uh, launched by several uh, users, so customers of A1. Uh, at the same time, uh, so it was unsuccessful, which is uh, quite understandable. So Belarusian court didn't take any arguments and. Uh, also, there was no new information requested, so it was uh, it was not uh, a trial, I would say. Um, so this is this is the way we live uh, uh, under those um, uh, pressure and uh, in those uh, circumstances. So 
we don't have legal uh, legal instruments. So we use court, uh, but only to fix, like to 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 record um, violations, to have some documents uh, that that it was uh, it was really um, it was really done. It was uh, it was existing situation. But at the same time, um, so we don't have like legal, uh, so legal results uh, and uh, some decisions which will make our life easier. So it is, uh, so that's why we move more to technical circumvention tools and to more uh, to education people how to uh, how to fight those restrictions, how to um, spread information freely. So. I would say that it is important to have uh, to have all instruments available and to use them um, for different purposes. But uh, we uh, cannot rely only on uh, some specific instruments like courts, uh, especially in this situation. So we rely mostly on our colleagues abroad. For example, so as it was said, the pressure on Sandwine uh, could not be organized from the Belarus, but it was uh, organized from California. At the same time, A1 Group, which is based in Austria, uh, will listen to their customers in Austria and uh, NGO groups in Austria rather than uh, to Belarusian customers. So it is quite obvious for us. So that's why we think that international cooperation will be very, very su successful. Thank you. Maybe Jana will add something. Yeah, maybe I will just add something about uh, how how people are dealing with the weekly shutdowns. Yeah, basically uh, there is uh, not much uh, people can do, but uh, we try to collect uh, the life hacks which will help uh, people to stay online and sometimes helps uh, VPN services, not all of them. Uh, what we faced uh, on, the, on August uh, when the shutdown uh, took place, that all popular VPN services were blocked. I mean, protocols of VPN services and uh, such a, a VPN service like tunnel beer, uh, private internet access, I don't know. Well, all basically popular ones were blocked. They can't go online because their protocols were blocked. And uh, less popular things are uh, still worked, uh, such as iPhone again and some others. And uh, right now on Sundays, if you are, have an opportunity to switch on the VPN before the mobile uh, network shutdown, you have an opportunity to, to stay online even when uh, they will uh, turn off uh, the uh, mobile um, internet. Uh, they use uh, different mesh uh, services. Uh, uh, it's uh, uh, messaging via Bluetooth and uh, and other uh, other tools. And uh, we have uh, other kinds of uh, apps. For example, app which uh, receive uh, SMS uh, with a decrypted information with encrypted information. Uh, which is adding to special uh, app on the phone, decrypting this message. And on, on this app, you can see what's going on in the, in the city where police, uh, uh, where the police stays, police lines, where uh, something like grenades or where uh, people are arrested. Well, it's kind of, you know, map, life map of, of, uh, of uh, happenings uh, in the city. And um, what else? Uh, we have uh, media outlets who try to help people outside uh, and they run a mobile number which you can call and uh, they update, uh, give updated information about uh, happenings uh, in, in the city. So basically uh, all the new, all, all the good uh, ways of communication, SMS, uh, uh, phone calls and other that's how they dealing with that basically and about the organizing so it's a very interesting thing about belarusian protests that uh, we don't really have some some of organization you know someone who are organizing it so people are uh, have uh, pretty good self organizations uh, and uh, right now well basically uh, last uh, i don't know two or three weeks uh, it's basically uh, small groups uh, within the areas uh, neighborhoods 
uh, and neighbors are collecting on their neighborhoods and just have some uh, activities uh, on weekends, so, well, on Sundays, basically. If, if I answer the question, uh, that's great. You did perfectly, yes. Um, thank you very much. Okay, there's a question from Maria. Um, you did touch on it a bit, but let me read it. Um, how is the situation now in Tanzania? Can people access Twitter and WhatsApp without any difficulties? And um, maybe I would ask, what can we expect to see in the future? And is Tanzania getting back completely online? Um, so Maria, please let us know the status of um, what's happening in Tanzania and what the future looks like. For, thank you for that question. Yeah, thank you for the share. Um, this, these are great questions. Um, well, the internet is not reliable still. So what happens is, is that um, Twitter definitely, um, you know, if, if you're very lucky, you might be able to log in. But honestly, without VPN, don't expect much. Some, some, sometimes some people log in without VPN. They can read some text, but definitely you cannot get... Um, you cannot get photo and video. So I think for those of us who have been using VPN, we don't really you know, experience that. But for regular users, this is a real problem. WhatsApp has, is back up again. And I think that uh, you know, we can expect seasonal shutdowns. I think going forward, what we will be able to see, and I really loved um, what, what I'm hearing from Peggy and from others as well, is that I think we need to hold people accountable. That is so important. We have to call them out. We have to hold them accountable. I think just sort of uh, giving a blank face saying this is state or the government is not enough. So I think that going forward, we have to become much better at, at looking at who the perpetrators are. In this case, some of the telecom companies, but I also think that within the government, we have got the regulator that oversees and is in charge of the IXP and of and every other activity online. So I think going forward, Felicia, this will be the way forward. Uh, also the building of coalition within Tanzania of human rights uh, groups, not only those who are particularly into the freedom of expression as Peggy well put it, but also a much larger coalition around the entire right or the basic human right to communication, which includes also access to internet that needs to be broadened up. So I think these are the, some of the most important things that I would point out in terms of connectivity and some of the future actions. Thank you very much. And then to tie that in, I would say that um, the Keep It On Coalition is here to help. And we did do a lot of assessment of elections um, and shutdowns. We did engage with governments um, prior to elections during um, shutdowns, as well as um, after the shutdown. So um, at the end of the session, I would provide some details with regards to how you would you can engage with the Keep It On Coalition and also how to reach out um, to um, be part of the fight against internet shutdowns globally. So I will go around for your closing remarks and I will start with Mon. In one minute or one minute, 30 seconds, let us know, um, yeah, briefly your, your closing remarks, your thoughts and what you think um, the future is for uh, human rights, specifically internet, uh, with regards to internet shutdowns in Myanmar. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, thank you, yeah. Um, uh, actually, uh, for the international dog, uh, uh, we we are doing like uh, uh, doing public statement and and also uh, petition to the to the president and state council, and also we, we also do uh, organize the campaign and protest as much as we can. Uh, in event like uh, COVID nineteen pandemic uh, PDO, uh, we we do like uh, uh, virtual protect. Uh, to, uh, so everyone can join right, with the Zoom link and in, in, in that uh, in in the protest and and in the protest uh, more than two hundred people are, are joined from from their uh, uh, from the different area in in the Zoom link. So oh, this is our 
uh, very fast fetch will protect uh, and also this protect uh, the, uh, against the internet shutdown in Myanmar. So, uh, and also, uh, at, at the same time, uh, you know, we, we are also discuss, discussing with a, a, a telecom operator, like uh, we, we have sent a letter to the telecom operator, like a description of our consent for internet shutdown, and um, uh, we, we have a meeting, uh, uh, how can we start it? And, you know, uh, this is the, the, the main root cause problem is like uh, the, the Article 77 or telecommunication law. So, so even though we, 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 we could stop the, the internet shutdown in our country now, the, uh, the government can, can do it again according to their law. So, so uh, we have to do is to stop the internet shutdown and also uh, to abolish the Article 77 or telecommunication law. So uh, now, now we are still uh, working with the uh, uh, member of parliament some are now elected uh, in, 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 the, in this coming new government. So, so uh, uh, and also the, the another thing is we do a complaint to that OECD uh, about the, the telecom operator company. Uh, so, and, uh, and then like, uh, but you know, oh, now the, the election is just, uh, just over and also the, the, COVID-19 pandemic is a very, you know, case are uh, raised uh, day by day. So that's why people are only okay. focused on that issue. Yeah, not, not in the international down. That's why we are a little bit, you know, uh, difficult to, to, to get attention from the public now. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I was very generous with you, with my time. But, um, yes. <laughs> okay, um, let me move to Peggy. Um, if you have any closing remarks. Um, no, I, I, I sort of gave mine before, but just to encourage all of you, I mean, the, the Keep It On Coalition, I, I follow it closely. I hope everybody on the call follows it closely. I find the materials that you release to be incredibly insightful and useful. Um, I think the my main goal is to try to help figure out how we get more visibility and impact, because I think a lot of, of what needs to be said is being said. Um, but for whatever reason, while we have a lot of governments and a lot of um, actors who, who make general statements about the fact, oh, isn't it bad that the internet is shut down, that isn't really followed up in a way that, you know, that moves, it for, moves the conversation forward. And I do think that that granular level of information that you're talking about, um, uh, Maria brought it up and Natalia as well about the, you know, who's doing what. And what does it look like in practice? You know, the more we get of that and the more we can compare it from place to place as well, I think will will give us new levers to increase the visibility and impact of some of these moves. So uh, just to encourage you all to keep up the wonderful work. Thank you. Thank you very much for the words of encouragement. Um, Natalia, do you have some closing remarks for us? Yes, um, yes, so I think in terms of the, <clears throat> the work that we still have a lot of work to do the, at Access Now and Keep It On Coalition, uh, we will keep engaging uh, government officials and companies uh, before elections as well, uh, educating them about the importance of the internet for human rights and keeping it on for transparent and legitimate elections. Um, and I think that governments uh, that are care about maintaining legitimacy and actually preventing violence during ele uh, elections and, and protests, uh, they would uh, listen to us and keep the internet on. Um, however, yes, we can, as we have seen in Belarus, Myanmar, and Tanzania, uh, the leaders, uh, some leaders are still willing to risk their legitimacy and uh, just stay in power at any cost uh, possible, and they shut down all, inter uh, all government critics. So in those cases, I think uh, we should uh, move from uh, seeking engagement to demanding accountability. So I would end with that. Thank you. Accountability is key and we'll keep pushing for that. All right, um, Gianna and Alexei, your closing remarks, please. So maybe I can start. 
Well, uh, I think that we, we had a great talk today. Uh, so, and we also talked about, like uh, all the talk was around several issues. And um, I would uh, sum up uh, for, for personally for me, I would sum up it like, uh, so we need uh, several points. So first, uh, that internet shutdowns is a human rights issue, but not telecom uh, issue. So, and that's, uh, that's why we need to, um, we, we need to cope with it uh, in the same way we deal with it um, uh, with other human rights violations. So first, we need comprehensive monitoring and uh, observation what is happening and recording the, the violations. So we know how to record war crimes. So uh, why, uh, so why wouldn't we get some more uh, instruments to record uh, internet shutdowns? So uh, second is education. So as uh, as far as we know how internet is uh, um, restricted, we know how to circumvent this, and we we need to. Um, to teach people to, we need to spread the word how to uh, get access to internet. So um, the third is uh, legal uh, activities uh, and uh, advocacy. So we need to use all available instruments to, um, to fight the internet shutdowns. And uh, we need to rely on international community in this because uh, so telecom market is quite uh, international one. And uh, it is easy to gather information from outside and also to, to involve lots of communities in, the, in this fight. So that's, uh, that's how I would uh, sum up the, our today's talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Jana, do you want to say something? I can give you like 10 seconds. Yeah, well, I just wanted that uh, the shutdowns are not helping at all to do all our governments want to do. So I think it's useless. And uh, my great, uh, great idea uh, and great willing not to uh, deal with that, with shutdowns, um, it's, it's useless. Yes, and I do agree. Internet shutdowns, um, they just violate human rights. They don't resolve any problems. So, um, Maria, um, your closing remark. Thank you very much. And I, I really enjoyed this conversation. It has been, um, I really love what is coming for everybody, uh, including the international litigation. I think it's very important um, that we have got the Keep It On Coalition. And many thanks, really, to the coalition for keeping um, the, the internet shut down so much on top of the agenda. It helped us in Tanzania, those of us who are so much tired in to be prepared. And I think that we did manage to still keep the flow of information on despite the shutdown. And to tell Africa that um, one of the biggest challenges we have is um, that we agree to give away our internet freedom to gatekeepers. We must be very careful. I would like to use these concluding remarks to tell all the activists, do not fall into the trap of saying that you need the government to censor you in any way. They will use the excuse of saying, oh, it's about child pornography, it's about crime. Don't trust them. It's better to police yourself. It is better to find ways to work with those who own these platforms like Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and find better ways of managing the flow of information and protecting young people, but don't allow and don't give away your internet freedom. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this powerful concluding remarks. So on behalf of Access Now and the Keep It On Coalition, I would like to thank all of you especially my esteemed panelists for making this discussion very, very insightful. And to our cherished participants, thank you so much for making time to join us. And so, as I promised, if you are an individual or a civil society organization that wants to know more about um, internet shutdowns and its impacts on human rights, kindly visit our website, www.accessnow.org and reach out to know more and to engage on the fight against internet shutdowns. Thank you all so much for your time and let's keep it on wherever we are. Bye-bye. <laughs>